The third guest speaker of our Parable Summer series served as the FBC student pastor from 2007 through 2014 under the leadership of John Blodgett. He remembers the ministry done through so many student projects such as Howie the House, Project 127, Snow Camps Every Year, Wilderness Trips, Mission Trips to the Dominican Republic, and the incredible adult leaders who served so faithfully. He and his family are still close and involved here at FBC, but he still can't quite figure out how to safely hang a hammock. Here goes Dad. And you guys all just witnessed the most tame, mild video of Jed known to mankind. Well, Jed, hey, listen, you remember our first conversation. Uh, when I met you, I said, the legendary Jed, finally. Everyone has told me about the glory days that is Jed Long. And you looked at me, kind of like you're looking at me right now, and then you burst into laughter. And as I got to know you, I kind of realized why that was a funny statement, but also, also, I equally understood why people would consider those the glory days, and a lot of you guys don't know this, but sometimes when I'm in over my head, I'll just send a quick text to Jed saying, help, and he'll come in, and I gotta imagine what's going through your head is like, bless his heart. <laughs> 18 months, tops. But you always help us out, and what I've also learned is that uh, student ministry is always better with your hand in it. So why don't you guys join me in welcoming Jed Long. Don't be silly, I have my, months on, my money on 20 months, not 18. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. So here's the thing. I go to first service, I sit right back there, always, and I never come to second service. So I'm looking out here right now and I'm like, wow, I know almost none of you. I mean, there's a few I'm like, oh, I recognize. The rest, I'm like, strangers, strangers. So it's important for me to set proper expectations for you as we get rolling because I'm no different to you than Dwight was or Jeff was, and you need to understand that Dwight and Jeff, I am not like them. Here's the text message that Phil sent out when he decided to do a youth pastor reunion series. I, I'm telling you, so this, so this is the invite, and I'm still standing there with my phone in my hand staring at it with this, like, shock. And Eric and Jeff are like, I'm in! And I'm going, oh, who came up with such a horrible idea? <laughs> and then the day before Dwight spoke, I'm, dra I'm traveling back from, from Illinois with, uh, with Jen, and I randomly said to her, I'm going to text Dwight. I'm going to tell him, set the bar low. <laughs> and moments later, I mean, it could not have been timed any better. Moments later, Je Jeff Rackinator says, praying for you this weekend, Dwight. And I'm like, oh, that's what I should have gone with. I should have gone with praying for you this weekend, Dwight, not set the bar low. That's why these fellows made it in ministry, and I did not. <laughs> John Blodgett was sitting right over here in the first service, and I said to him, John, let's... I served under John Blodgett originally. He was the senior pastor, and I said to him, John, let's be honest. If you were still sitting over here, wisdom and discernment would have kept this from happening this morning. And I felt like he agreed. Did you feel like he was kind of in agreement? I did. No, we did. I did. I also told Phil, I'm almost done with this, by the way, but I also told Phil that I was going down memory lane, you know, preparing, remembering my time as youth pastor. And I remembered a time on a Monday morning, I was walking into the office, and I turned the corner, and there was Phil in my office, sitting with his head buried into his hands. In the first service, I said, what's, what's bad about this moment right now is this happened on such a regular basis that right now, Phil is trying to think, what story is he telling? What story is he telling? And he's just a little bit nervous, and he went, uh-huh. So he's there. He's buried just like this. 
He doesn't even look up. He said, please, please tell me that you did not launch a $100,000 loose change campaign in youth ministry last night and no one in leadership at the church knows. Please tell me John Blodgett knows. (laughs) And I so clearly remember saying, oh, you have a point here, Phil. (laughs) And yet here we are. Here we are. You decided to go for it anyways and put me back up here. We've been in a series entitled um, Personalizing the Parables. And a few weeks ago, Dwight said there's 46 times in the four Gospels that Jesus used stories to teach. The truth of the matter is this. I have struggled immensely to put this together for today. Like, Honestly, the hardest message I have ever put together is the one that I am going to attempt to preach for you. One reason might be that that Phil pulled me out of retirement and I've preached one time in 10 years. But the other reason is that no matter no matter how I went after this passage, no matter how I approached this passage, I found myself coming to the same place. You should do it. We should. I should. And I didn't want to preach a should message. So I struggled and I struggled and I struggled. And so this morning we're going to do a bit of a non-traditional morning. We're going to steal the play from Jesus's playbook and we're going to throw a bit of storytelling into this morning. Maybe too much storytelling, honestly. (laughs) Honestly, I'm not for sure. But we're going to go for it anyways. And here's the thing. No matter what happens, I have good news. In the prior 10 years, I've only spoken once. That means that this sermon covers the next decade, and the next time I will fall onto the preaching calendar will be 2034. So no matter what this morning, we're going to be good to go. (laughs) So we're going to give it a shot. And I am going to start this morning with a random story, very random. And when I finish that story, I'm going to walk away from it without even talking about why I told the story. Hopefully it makes sense later. 20 years ago, it is shocking for me to say those words. 20 years ago, I was in Iraq, stationed at a place called Fob Wilson, about 30 miles from Tikrit. In between Majama and Adwar was where Fob Wilson was sandwiched. What Fob Wilson is famous for is about one mile outside of our main gate is the hole where Saddam was found. And that's, that's, that's the only reason anyone would have any idea what that location is, is because it's famous for that one reason and that one reason alone. While I was in Iraq, I spent a significant amount of time functioning as the sergeant of the guard overseeing security of our perimeter. We had about 400 soldiers, give or take, on that fob, two gates, and five towers. And each night, people could go to sleep because there was 18 people standing guard, and during the day and at night, 24 hours a day, there was 18 people standing guard. It was at that fob that I served with the worst soldier I ever served with. It was in the middle of the night while the entire camp was asleep that I found this soldier laying on the floor on the base of his guard tower. He had taken off his helmet. He had taken off his body armor. And he had made the decision to lay down and go to sleep. Mm, I heard that. Like, yeah, it does the same thing. Inside of me, I go, mmm. He paid a price for that. He went from being a specialist to being a private. He took half of his, half of two months worth of pay was taken and he did four hours of extra duty for 45 days straight. And I put him on gate five, the dreaded gate. No one wanted to be on gate five. It was just, it's a long story. It doesn't matter. But he was there for months and he kept saying, sorry, let me go back to the towers. Sergeant, let me go back to the towers. And against my better judgment, I put him on tower two. As dawn came, I went around and I picked up one soldier from every tower to take them, from bre- take them to breakfast. 
And we were there, and I was in the cafeteria, and we got a barrage of mortars that came in on top of us. When you're there long enough, you learn to know where those are coming from, how close they are, and about where they're landing. And I knew. That's near Tower 2. And so did our talk. Uh, Tactical Operating Center, their call sign was Dragon Zulu. And I heard over the radio, Tower 2, Tower 2, this is Dragon Zulu, over. Silence. Tower 2, Tower 2, this is Dragon Zulu, over. Silence. I got on the radio and I said, Dragon Zulu, this is SOG, wait, one. And I drove to Tower 2, and I climbed up into Tower 2, and I found that soldier. He had taken off his helmet. He had taken off his body armor. First day. That's the first day I put him back in the tower. He had taken off his helmet. He had taken off his body armor. And he got himself comfortable. And he had laid down. And he had made the choice to go to sleep. To this day, that story creates unbelievable negativity within me. But as I promised, we're going to leave that story behind. We're going to move on and pretend like I did not just tell that story. I haven't actually told you yet what my parable is going to be. It's the parable of the talents found in Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 through 30. And if you have your Bibles, please turn there um, as we will be reading all of those verses. But first, I'm going to open us up in prayer. Dear Father, I, I come to you again for the second time this morning, standing in, in front of a group of people, and I ask, you, um, I ask you to take a story that you originally told. Um, God, I, I am praying that the original intent and message of this parable that you told is the message that people hear this, this morning. Um, God, I'm I'm praying for myself and I'm praying for the people here that, that you had a purpose in this story. You had something you wanted us to learn and God, I just pray that that learning would happen this morning. We ask you to do that, Lord, in your name. Amen. Matthew 25, starting in verse 14. For it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To the one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. He would receive five talents, went at once and traded with them and made five talents more. So also, he who had two talents made two talents more. But he who had received one talent went and dug into the ground and hid his master's money. Now after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with him. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here, I have five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And, as, and he also who had two talents came forward, saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here, I made two talents more. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He also who had received one talent came forward saying, master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you do not sow and gathering where you scatter no seed. So I was afraid. And I went and I hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master answered him, you wicked and slothful servant. You knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I scatter no seed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers. And at my coming, I could have received what was, what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has 10 talents. For to everyone who has will be given and he who has an abundance and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken and cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. And in that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Truthfully, if you compare this parable to all of the other parables in scripture, this parable 
is one of the easiest parables to actually say what was Jesus meaning. There's not a ton of interpretation and figuring out in this parable that needs to happen. Honestly, it's why I chose it. It was one of the easiest ones I thought to preach on. It just didn't go as planned. So here's what we're gonna do. While it is easy, I want to make sure that we are all on the same page. And what I want to do is take the passage that we just read, and I want to go back to the top and walk, walk our way down and make sure that, to draw some principles to make sure that we are completely tracking with each other, okay? So it starts with, for it will be. We know from verse 1 of chapter 25 that he's talking about the kingdom of heaven. For the kingdom of heaven will be, and then he goes on and tells his story. We also know now that when he was talking at that time and he said, hey, there's going to be a master and he's going to call his servants and then he's going to entrust them to something and he's going to go on a journey. Well, now we know that he was talking about when he was going to ascend into heaven and he was going to say to us, I have entrusted something to you. And he said, I'm going to be gone a long time. He was right. (laughs) He was going to be gone. A lo- not as much long, much longer. If you, so Phil saying every single week. I find it interesting then, in verse fifteen, that Scripture unapologetically states that we are not all the same. We have different abilities. Some have more abilities than others. Not more value, but more ability. And those with additional ability are given additional responsibility to manage. I also think as we're walking down this passage, making sure that we're all on the same page, that we talk about what is a talent. Because in our culture, if we read this passage simply by what is a talent, we think, oh, I have a talent, I'm good at soccer. I I have a talent, I can play piano. The reality is that was not the talent that Jesus was speaking of in Matthew chapter 25. Jesus was using money as the illustration, and frankly, it was probably in, 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 what, in their culture, a lot of money. Because a talent is a unit of measurement. Depending on what area they were in, that, that unit of measurement was somewhere between 60 and 75 pounds. So when he says, I gave him one talent, he means I gave them something that was 60 to 75 pounds. Most likely, the way this would have been interpreted is 60 to 75 pounds of gold. In our money, just for what it's worth, one talent, 60 pounds, if we go on the the low side, one talent of gold today is worth $1.6 million. Two talents of gold today is worth 3.2, and five talents of gold is worth $8.1 million. The reality is, the person that was only given one talent was in all reality, trusted with a significant amount of money. Now, when I teach, people have a habit of completely tuning out. So this is the moment that I need to say to you, hey, just come back for a moment, because I don't want you to miss. Like, we've kind of just been walking ourselves through this, but this next line, these next concepts are important, okay? So come on back if I've I've lost you, and let's say, and listen here. While Jesus used money for the sake of his illustration, his intention was not to tell a parable about money. It's not his point. Jesus, Jesus' intention was to tell a story that represented his expectations that his followers be faithful with all that they had been entrusted to. This is the point. Jesus told a story to communicate his expectation that if you're my servant, if you're my follower, you're going to be faithful with what I've entrusted you to. Now, I said earlier this isn't about, the story isn't about money, and it's true, but honestly, it's a little bit about money because we know that God has entrusted finances to us. I said earlier that that it's not about talent, the way we define talent, and well, that's true, that's not, but at the same time, it, it is about talent because God has entrusted talents to us. Whether they're just natural born talents or whether they're spiritual gifts, the reality is we have been entrusted, 
And the, honestly, the list can go on and on. And I don't need to go on and on because the, the overarching concept is this. The point of the parable is Jesus is saying, hey, I've given you stuff and I'm believing and trusting that you will be faithful. I believe Jesus was saying, hey, I'm going away and I'm trusting you. As the story goes on, we see in verse 19, it says, after a long time, the master returned and settled accounts. I think it's super important to catch the fact that when the servant that had five talents came and said, here, I've gotten five more, Jesus said, well done, a good and faithful servant. But when the person that had two talents came and said, here, I've gotten two more, the exact same words were used by Jesus. There is no additional praise, affirmation, that a boy, that the person with five got than the person with two. Why? Because it wasn't about five or two. <laughs> it was only about their faithfulness. And they both were faithful. That makes sense, right? Am I, are we tracking as we walk through this story? I just want to make sure we're tracking. Okay. I don't know what I would have done if you said no, but... Phil says that kind of stuff sometimes, so it seemed like a, it seemed like a good idea. <laughs> All right, so then the story takes a turn, and we see the one, the one talent person show up and give his account. He was scared, and he buried it. To which the master responds, you wicked and lazy servant. And the master instructs the servant to be cast into outer dark, darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That section of this parable, that, that couple verses right now of that parable, that's a hard couple of verses. That, that's a hard couple of verses. And I will say, say, admit to you that there are different interpretations of what that means. Personally, I believe the most obvious interpretation of that is the correct interpretation. And I believe that the most honest interpretation is that that ser third servant was meant to represent someone who was not a true follower of Christ. We see key signs of this from the very beginning of this, of this parable when scripture says immediately he buried it. Because Matthew chapter seven says that a true follower will produce good fruit. And in this story, talents were given Talents were buried. There was zero fruit produced. The most obvious interpretation is the third servant was never a follower of Christ. Now, I will admit to you, there is another interpretation that says um, that at the end of the story, you see just unbelievable remorse for opportunities wasted to serve God. The good news is I'm not planning on centering the rest of my message on the end, so we can agree right here. Here's what we can agree. No matter what you believe, we can agree to this very fact that at the end, if someone is not using their talents to serve and honor Christ, there's going to be unbelievable regret. That much we can agree on. Well, there you go. Matthew 25, 14 through 30, the parable of the talents. As a follower of Christ, each one of us has been entrusted with talents and we should use them. You should use them. I should use them. And this brings us back to the place that we started just a few minutes ago that I have struggled immensely with delivering what I believe the full meaning of this passage is because I do not think the point is you should. So I have two choices. Choice number one is to say, well, great. You should use your talents. Let's pray and be dismissed. And choice number two is, 
I can tell another story. Now, I will know this. There's a huge population of this room thinking, please choose choice one. Please pray and dismiss. Please pray and dismiss. Well, I have bad news. I have been disappointing people since 1981. And today will be no different. Who's been to the tomb of the, like, like physically been to the tomb of the unknown soldier? Can you put your hands up? So, I don't know, maybe 10% of the room, somewhere in there. It is an amazing and humbling experience if you have been there. In 1921, Congress authorized the burial of a single soldier from World War I to be placed into the tomb. This is just amazing to me, but since... Since April 6th, 1948, that tomb has been under constant guard by the Army's 3rd Infantry Regiment. Every day. Seven days a week. 365 days a year. For 76 years. They have guarded that tomb without fail. I believe what happens at that place is one of our country's greatest representations of respect. I believe it is forever the way that we show honor to those that did not make it home. I believe it gives some semblance of comfort to families whose loved ones never returned home to them. And in my opinion, just for what it's worth, my opinion. It's not worth much. In my opinion, the men and the women from the Army's 3rd Infantry Regiment who are entrusted with this responsibility take place in one of the greatest honors that, they, that can happen here on this earth. I can personalize this a bit farther. On June 8th, 2005, Lieutenant Fosnott was killed by a roadside bomb in Iraq. I was serving with him. I'm doing better this service than I did the last. <clears throat> when, someone, when we lost someone in Iraq, they did not come back to the FOP, ever. Choppers would come in and they would take them. Bringing people back was not good for morale. But on this day, June 8th, we were at the start of what was the worst sandstorm that I had ever been in and I ever was in that lasted three days and choppers could not fly. So on this day, the lieutenant was brought back to us. There we go. We made him a coffin We placed him in the center of our fob. And he was there for three days. It was during those three days that my men and I guarded him. He did not need our protection. You understand that, right? He was safe. But he could no longer. He could no longer defend himself. So not because we needed to, but because it was our honor. My man and I guarded him for three days. Today and until the day I die, I will say to you that one of the greatest honors of my life was to guard the lieutenant. But I have a question for you. Why is it so easy for me to stand here and talk about the tomb of the unknown soldier 
and say that to be part of guarding the tomb is one of the greatest honors. And I believe it. And I feel it. Why is it? It is so easy for me to stand here and tell you that guarding the lieutenant was one of the greatest honors of my life. And I believe it. And I feel it. But so often when it comes to being faithful with my gifts, my abilities, my finances, it seems like a duty. It seems like something I should do. I have spent a lot of time processing that very question. Could it be as simple as I have not focused enough on the ultimate sacrifice that Jesus Christ paid? If I was going to be honest with you, it is easier for me to emotionally connect with the sacrifices of the men and the women that gave the ultimate sacrifice for our freedom than it is for me to emotionally connect with Christ's ultimate sacrifice, if I was going to be honest with you. What if? What if? For some of us, this piece that is missing, to move this parable from the I should, we should, to a it is my honor, is nothing more than a better understanding and appreciation of the sacrifice that Christ made on our behalf. What if, as we came to a fuller appreciation and focus on Christ's sacrifice, our emotions automatically started to move from the should to the honor. Do you think that may be why in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 we are commanded to come together on a regular basis and participate in communion in remembrance of? Do you think that it is possible that God knew that if we didn't keep at the forefront of our mind Christ's sacrifice, that we may lose the motivation that is so vital? Maybe. Just maybe there's a group here in this room who, like me, need to be intentional to keep Christ's sacrifice ever before them and focus on the honor that it is to serve him until... After a long time, according to the parable, he returns. Ready to make a jump? I told you we were going to, whew, ready to make a jump? We'll make a jump. Let's leave that. Sylvia Lambright is not going to be in the, unless she came to two services. Sylvia Lambright is not going to be in the service, but I, I didn't want to just, like, not celebrate all that's happening right now in faithfulness. And I brought up Sylvia Lambright. She was sitting right back there. And Sylvia, Lam Sylvia spent her entire life as a missionary. She retired, and she's still serving. I have all these people, like, nodding their head yes right now, because if, especially if you're part of, like, you know, like a, a small group and you go serve, if you end up in the first grade room at night, Sylvia is going to be there. And she's going to teach the lesson, and she's going to do an incredible job. And I asked her last time I was in there what her age was. And I'm not going to tell any of you because it's none of your business and you don't ask a woman her age. <laughs> but when she told me her age, after I asked, what a testimony. What a testimony from the start of serving her entire life to be the age that she is now, young at heart, coming in here every single Sunday night, serving, serving. Rick and Kathy Billman, are you in this service? Yeah, look, we didn't come to church at all today. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> it's your fault. All right. <laughs> sorry. All right. Rick and Kathy, for, for I think 10 years now, like legitimately, I believe 10 years now, um, have, have, have been serving and running that cafe right out there. 
And you say, well, it's just a cafe. No, it's, it, I mean, it's not just a cafe. It's actually raising funds that are helping kids be able to afford to go to camp and on trips as it helps to offset that. And as a prior youth pastor, that is near and dear to my heart. Tina Bowser, are you in the service? Tina also serves in that cafe, but in addition to that, Tina, I know this is over a decade now, on, on, on one night a month, makes food and goes to Faith Mission and serves at Faith Mission every month. Every month for over 10 years, she has done this. How faithful, how unbelievable. You should look for opportunities to jump in with Tina Bowser and serve. Go with her. Be an incredible opportunity. Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, are you in the house? <laughs> Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, this is Long John Silver. Hi, Paul. Paul used to work in youth ministry. When we would drive places back in the day, we had these radios that we would go back and forth and talk, and Paul's call sign was Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, and mine was Long John Silver. 27 years. That's a long time in youth ministry. <laughs> 27 years Paul Parsons served in youth ministry. I remember when I started in youth ministry and had no business being a youth pastor. Paul came, placed his hand onto my shoulder, and he said these words to me, I have your back. I sent a text message independently to Eric and to Dwight and to Jeff, and I said the words, Paul Parsons, give me one to four sentences. Dwight said, in one word, everything. He was a detail guy I, couldn't totally, I could totally depend on um, without another thought. He was, the, he was one of the key disciplers who leveraged what he did for a job to disciple students as well as anyone I have ever met. Plus, he was a great friend to me personally. Jeff said, when I was an intern and I crashed one of the school buses into a historic building on the third grade field trip, it was Paul who came to clean up the mess. From that time on, his mantra to me was, I've got your back. And he always did. And I am forever grateful. Eric said, Paul Parsons was the one guy I knew that always had my back. He did whatever it took to make sure things behind the scenes always went as smoothly as possible. I've, I've also never met another leader that cares better for his small group guys long after they graduate from high school. I am convinced that every youth pastor needs a Paul Parsons to be a success. I called the church and I said, hey, I really was hoping Paul was gonna be here for both services. Is he scheduled to be on the tech team? They said, no, he's not scheduled this week. I said, it's Paul Parsons. I said, hey, I need you to like can somebody off the cameras and tell Paul Parsons, <laughs> <laughs> you need help. <laughs> and uh, there he is. Paul, it looks like you had their back. Ready to take another shift? Go another direction? Many of you know the story in 2 Samuel 12 where Nathan the prophet comes to David after he has had an affair with Bathsheba and killed her husband and Nathan tells David a story. He told him a story of a rich man who stole the lamb, one lamb, from a poor man and killed it. And David, hearing the story, was infuriated and demanded punishment for such a man. And then Nathan, after David had connected with the story, uttered the words, you are the man. Those words fell on David in a way that could only have happened because he had connected with the story that Nathan had told. Remember that story I told earlier about the soldier 
that fell asleep. The story of a man who had been trusted with responsibility. The story of a man who chose to take off his helmet, to take off his body armor, and to simply lay down and go to sleep. Remember that story? It may be, it may be that some of us today need to hear the words, you. You are that man. It is possible that some of us today need to hear the words, you, you are that woman. You are that teenager. It is so unbelievably easy for me to feel unbelievable ne negativity towards that soldier. It's a whole lot harder to see myself in that story. It's a whole lot harder to say, whew, I've been entrusted with something way greater than standing in that tower. And I can, I can point to whole seasons of my life where I took off my helmet. I took off my body armor and I laid it down and I said, I'm just gonna go to sleep. I'm just, I don't know, I, I know things have been entrusted to me, but I'm just gonna go to sleep. It may be that today there are people here that need to bend down, they need to pick up that helmet, they need to put that back on. They need to put on the body armor again. And they need to recognize the significance of what was entrusted to them and that it is our honor to live that out. For those of you that struggle if you don't have an outline, especially when people jump from one location to another with very little warning. As I wrestled for way longer than I expected to on how to deliver this parable, I was trying to figure it out. I wrote this down. I said, what are my tasks to accomplish? And I said, I want to simply explain the parable. I want to get the story out of the should world. I want to celebrate the faithfulness that is all around us in the room we are sitting in. I want to push hard for self-evaluation. And then I want to just say like, hey, where do we go from here? And that's where we're at. Um, the answer to your question is, I don't know where you go from here. I don't. I do know that we all, all, should give an honest evaluation to, am I being faithful? Again, John Blodgett was sitting right there and I looked at him and I said, John, this means you. Because he's in a new season of life. He's not sitting there anymore. Now he's sitting there. I also said, don't you dare take that helmet off. <laughs> Do self-evaluation. Where am I today? Am I being faithful today? And then take personal responsibility for that. Well, they never asked me. Okay, <laughs> fine. You take personal responsibility. You see, I have no idea where to go. Okay, great option. Uh, that journey that they keep talking about that happens, I don't know, like every two months they do like a four-week thing. Um, one of the things that happens is there, they talk to you about your, like let's talk about your gifts and where you can plug in and what you can do. And, and this message, to be clear, is not just like how can you serve at FBC. That's not what this is at at all. This is life. I'm just trying to give some practical ways to start plugging in into doing some things. So there you go, guys. This is... This is the best I could do to try to figure out this parable that Jesus taught. 
and bring it to us in a way that hopefully makes sense and begins, if necessary, in some of us to say, ooh, it's not about the should, it's about the honor. So, thank you. I love you, brother. I love how God's wired you and put you together in the way that you think. And I needed that today. And I had to sit through it twice and got it nailed twice. You know, Some of us need that, though. Hey, let's stand together and let's end like this today. Because that message speaks to every single one of us, no matter where we are. We will always have to grow in this until Jesus comes back. Because we always have a propensity to serve ourselves, to take off our helmet, take off our armor, get comfortable, and serve ourselves and fall asleep. Take a break, right? A brand new, fresh way this is hitting me today because I grew up in the culture, the church culture of duty. And it has been a big journey for me to stop serving the Lord out of duty and serve him out of honor. And I have found and I've come to the conclusion that it's easier to, it's easier to be faithful and remain faithful if I'm doing it out of honor instead of duty. I have a greater level of faithfulness, but I always have this pull back to the other way. So um, back in the old days, when we would have a sermon like this, the piano player would start playing a song called Just As I Am or I Surrender All. And we would sing, I surrender all. And I would always get brokenhearted and I would come down to the front and I would kneel down and I would surrender it all. A brand new, fresh way. We just don't do it that way anymore. Maybe we should go back to that and do it again. Here's the challenge, though. I would challenge just every single one of us, do, do some business with the Lord today. You, you can come up here. We always have prayer team members that are here to pray over anything you would like to have prayer over. You can just come down to the front and give your heart to the Lord anew and afresh today um, or sit right in your pew or your seat or turn around and kneel right where you are or you can do it at home. But my challenge to you is don't, don't let this message fly over your head. Sit in it for a while today and ask the Lord if you're giving your talent to him out of honor instead of out of obligation. Let me pray over that for you. Lord, I pray for all of us. I pray for me too, that you would lead us to a place of repentance. And some of us need to just repent because we've just been, we've checked out and bring us back, Lord. Um, but all of us need to have this focus of, because it is such an honor to be called by you, equipped by you, gifted by you, chosen by you, and entrusted with the story of salvation, entrusted with spiritual gifts to serve the body with, and a message to serve the world with. And I pray that you will challenge our hearts to, to, to be doing it out of more honor out of, because, and gratitude out of what you have done for us instead of obligation. Don't let us be like the Pharisees, Lord. Forgive us when we're like that and draw our hearts back into it so that we can be used by you to the maximum capacity. And it's in your name, Lord Jesus, that we pray this. Amen. God bless you as you go. Let's go make a difference for the Lord out of honor for him. God bless you. Let's give, let's just thank him one more time, okay? Thank Jed one more time for this.